This pretty little snake is the eastern coral snake. It is a small, shy species that lives on the ground most of its life. Now, the thing about the eastern coral snake is it happens to be highly venomous. If you were to get bitten by this snake, you'd be in a lot of trouble. This one right here was actually found in someone's backyard. It was rescued by the Bush Wildlife Sanctuary. Today, it's going to its new home and it's going to be helping one dedicated snake expert to unlock the mysteries of its venom. Jack Facetti is the gentleman we're about to meet. We're gonna go for a ride up to St. Cloud, Florida, where we're gonna find out all about this magnificently beautiful snake's venom. There are two things I've loved most in this life, bikes and reptiles. Now, I crisscross the globe learning about all kinds of incredible animals. Sometimes, I know what I'm doing. Other times, I'm in over right, my head. But one thing's for certain, we'll come away a whole lot smarter after every adventure. This is Camp Kennedy. This is the Venom Laboratory of Jack Vicente, Floridian who has committed himself to producing a large supply of coral snake venom. When I say this place is hot, I mean it's hot. The lab is loaded with all sorts of venomous creatures. The main residents here are dozens of eastern coral snakes. All right, Jack, so I have uh, two more residents for your collection. Hopefully their venom will come in useful for you, but I'm really excited to be here with you today because I've heard so much about you. I know you uh, were mentored by Bill Host, who's a legendary figure in you know venom research and ven handling venom snakes, but what specifically have you got going on in this pretty cool snake room right here? Thank you, Kenneth. What we have specifically here is a coral snake venom production laboratory. Cool. All of this venom is going for the use uh, by a Pfizer Pharmaceutical for the making of a North American coral snake anti-venom, uh, which we hope will be out uh, maybe this year. Now, can I ask and, just a second, real sure. quick? Is there has there? I've been hearing stories that there's actually a uh, shortage of this this anti-venom. Is that there, true? There's a shortage because no more anti-venom has been being made for four okay. or five years now, and the stuff that's available is FDA approved for use even though it's expired, it's the old Wyeth anti-venom. Okay. And yes, there, it's not readily available everywhere. Uh, you know, it's sporadically spread out. So when this anti-venom comes out and there's anti-venom everywhere, it'll be uh, a better thing for everybody. What we do is all of the snakes are in the trays here. Uh, coral snake condo, if you will, goes back uh, about 22 inches. They love to burrow. They're a burrowing snake anyway. They stay in the ground most of the time. They're out a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening. Uh, and let me get this snake hook here. Oh, that's beautiful. There's heat strips in the back. That's why you see a lot of them. They'll stay in the back where it's warm. And uh, when you know when you try to get them to go after them, their first instinct is to get away. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not aggressive. They do this kind of weird, you see that weird like flippy motion? Yeah, it's a weird flipping, a defensive motion, and then it, it eventually gets to, after a, a couple of minutes of this, they'll actually flatten out, they'll curl their tail up, they'll show, they're trying to make themselves bigger, they're trying to scare you away. Yeah, they're not okay. a bitey snake generally, they're a no. shire species. They're a shire species. Thankfully, yes. because their venom is pretty, uh, Pretty good stuff, isn't it? It's pretty good stuff. You know, they generally, on the average, you probably get a couple of lethal doses per bite. It's a slow acting venom, so time's on your side. However, you know, it's a presynaptic toxin, so the important thing is get antivenom as soon as possible to neutralize that effect before it takes over. Is it shuts down your respiratory system, you stop yeah. breathing. Yeah, okay? that's not good. There's little to, to no local damage. You'll get a little bit of local pain, maybe, maybe not. It could be either way. So there again, no pain doesn't mean you didn't get venom. You'll get a little local edema, maybe, maybe not, goes both ways. However, it's just been recently studied and the venom for the coral snake, eastern coral snake, is, is identical. It doesn't change in the geographical range like some of the other snakes do, like our eastern diamondback changes. You know, we're seeing that sometimes the venom from a coral snake bite stays local longer than we thought. You know, it can get in the lymphatic system. Once it starts going and gets moving, then things start to happen. Uh, but, you know, compared to a cobra or another alapid, which are your cobras and your mambas, you know, and your tiger snakes, the coral snake venom is a slower acting venom on a human. Gotcha, and that's, a, that's, that's interesting, you know, since they are found in the southeastern United States, which has got a high population density of people, does that benefit human beings? 
That uh, it is slow acting, that it gives you enough time? Yes, it benefits human beings. Yeah, the, the big thing about a coral snake is the danger to me with coral snake bites are children. Children are fascinated by the color. They pick them up, they play with them, they pinch them, they get bit. Hmm. You step on them barefoot, you could get bit. But it, it, in their natural habitat where they live around your house, you're probably not going to see them much. Uh, they're, they're very... They're an easygoing guy. Their their temperament's easy. Uh, all they want to do is get away. Uh, and with, when you see the amount of people that come in with that say they got bitten, there's a high percentage of dry bites with coral snakes too. So you got all these things in your favor. So the the danger is of being bitten is overrated. The the danger or the toxic toxicity of the venom is not overrated. It's a very toxic venom, and they do not need to bite. Uh, to chew when they bite to deliver. Most of that venom's ejected immediately. However, they do chew, and the longer they stay on, you'll get more, so get them off right away. Gotcha. They do not need to bite you between a finger. They can turn around and bite you right here just like any These snake. These are all wives' tails. Yeah. tails fable. They eat other snakes. That's their primary diet. They huh. eat other snakes. Um, I've had some cannibalism occasionally. Uh, cannibalism does occur, but it's not, you know, all the time. So their venom's designed to take down, you know, another cold-blooded animal. Well, continue right. on this little tour, man. All right, what we're gonna do here, this particular specimen came from Boynton Beach. Hey, not too far from me. Not too far from you. This one is a relatively uh, different one. He's got twin spots on the oh, red. Wow, look at that, it's beautiful. You see the, the twin spots I on do, the red, yeah. which is not, you know, normal. Um, there again, I'll remind you, you know, red against yellow, kill a fellow, red against black, venom lack, that's a fancy poem. However, this could be confused with this specimen because somebody could say, oh, there's a red and black, it's harmless. Right, it's, but if it's actually... If you don't know what the snake is, do not pick it up. Okay? That's easiest way not to get easiest bit. Easiest way not to get bit. What I do here is put just a little bit of water on my fingers. Okay. Now, when you go for their neck, I mean, there's a very narrow margin of error, and the way you're handling the snake is much different than, say, a zookeeper would handle the snake. Since you're yeah. doing venom extraction, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the differences there? Venom extraction, folks have to handle the snake a little differently. We've got to make contact with the animal. We've got to pick it up behind the head. We've got to get the venom out. In the case of the coral, we also feed it with a tube, which you'll see. This is not the recommended way to keep snakes. You, if you're going to keep a snake, uh, uh, the proper husbandry is you don't need to pick the snake up hardly ever. Right. You can use a hook. Uh, you can use these tubes we have right here. They come in various sizes from here all the way to this size. You, co you, you coax a snake into the tube and then you grab it by the end of the tube and now I can't bite you. Now you can medicate it, you can work on it, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, so, so the way I'm handling today is not a recommended way. It's kind of the nature of the beast uh, because we're going through volume right. and it comes with a little more inherent risks. You know, the, the thing you're fighting is the human factor. Yeah. You're gonna take a chance, you're gonna break a protocol, you're gonna get lazy and move something without taking a snake out you'll do something like that and that's that's what will happen all right now there's there's some previously collected venom that's cooled in this vial yeah you want to all right it? his want lovely it. assistant sally will hold the snake <laughs> sally's gonna hold it there and look at that all right now this one was ready to bite now see sure he's was. holding on and he is twisting that vial i'm not all right that venom is very viscous. We'll put it here. And there's not even enough venom to, to copiously flow down the vial yet. You, you might see it in a minute. Now, now, with the bite that we just saw this animal give, is that enough to be detrimental to a full-grown human being? The, the snake of this size, this is a relatively larger than average snake. This is a snake probably about 30 inches. Okay. I average with all of these about 10 milligrams per bite. Mm. These guys on the bigger is probably about a 12 or 15 milligram. Uh, with everything that you can read and conclude, you might be able to say five milligrams, four to five milligrams could be a lethal dose for an average person. So what you got here is two to maybe three lethal doses in a bite. Wow. Yes. They're in control of what they release. Under control, and a good solid hard bite, they're gonna deliver more venom on a bite when they're after a food vitam, 
a food item, if they're biting in self-defense and they're moving and whipping, there's a good chance of a dry bite, probably 30 to 50 percent chance that you didn't get any venom. Mm. Either the venom was not released uh, the time the fangs punctured or after or before. Yeah. And then, of course, any kind of clothing will protect you with, with a snake bite, especially very a coral snake. Yeah, very small fangs. Very small fangs. They're in the front. They're fixed. They're not rear fanged. That's right. another fable. Um, and they're very sharp. Because of the way Jack has to grab these small snakes behind the neck to milk them, there is very little margin for error. If he grabs too far back, he's going to get bit. If he grabs too far up, he'll get a fang in the thumb, which obviously isn't good. Thankfully, Jack has been doing this for many years, and he's as good as they get. But milking the coral snake's venom is only one step in this process. Jack's facility has dozens of snakes that need to be kept ultra healthy, so they can keep producing vigorous amounts of venom. Jack's diet for them is a very interesting one. All right, we're going to mix up some food here. We start with four cans of Gerber Number no. Two chicken and gravy, and. Uh, baby food. So, you know, my question is this. In your experience, what, how do you start becoming a chef for coral snakes? I mean, how does one well, figure out uh, how to feed them like this? Long ago, uh, back in the early Bill Haas days, Bill force-fed everything he did. And he come up with formulas of dog food to grinding rats and grinding chickens to sending us to the slaughterhouses to get fresh raw blood and he would go through this uh, process to try to duplicate all the nutrients. Bill Haas was a nutritionist himself, a, hmm. a, a very avid, uh, he never knew that. Oh yeah, uh, he ate he ate the way we should be eating 80 years ago. So That's why he lived to be 106 why, yeah, months, right? That sure is. So anyway, knowing that when you look at the nutritional contents of baby food compared to some of the prey items that you can look up on the internet and see what their uh, what their contents are, this baby food pretty much has it all. The difference is with a coral snake being ophiophagus, which means they eat other snakes, they're getting a lot of calcium, you, you, all the skeletal uh, component of a, another snake. So this baby food's a little low on calcium, we felt. So we thought, well, we can add some calcium. The, the important thing with calcium is it has to be phosphorus free. Right. You don't want to put phosphorus for a snake. Lizards and turtles, the phosphorus is okay. And then we supplement it with a little bit more of bionate, which is just a vitamin mineral power you know, for pets. And we put that in there. And then they need a lot of zinc in their diet. They need protein. We came up, uh, uh, actually, the folks at up, up in Tallahassee recommended that I try this Hills prescription diet. It's a, it's a prescription dog food used on dogs and cats for a couple weeks after surgery. It's got extra nutrients. To kind of boost their system. Boost their, uh, so, so we come up with uh, one teaspoon per four jars, one and a quarter, is pretty much optimum for that. And uh, we take all this here and we just mix it up with this blender. I mean, yeah. We'll go through about 16 jars of this to feed everybody in here if we get them all in one day. Ah. You don't want to whip this too on because you, get the, it, 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 uh, you put too much air in. That's a nice homeo yeah. homeogenous mixture there yep. from chemistry class. I get to use words yeah. that I haven't in a while. Now we got a good consistency. It'll flow, it'll flow through real good. All right, now what we'll do is we'll cap the, uh, the hills for the next batch here today. And we'll take a 60 milliliter, 60 cc syringe. Alrighty. And we'll draw up the contents of our formula. Push out the air, and then we'll do, go again. That's about 65, and then push it back down to the 60 mark. All right. Now this is, you do this prior to getting the snakes out and yeah. uh, milking them, right? This yeah. is the last process for the day or the last step in your process? No, this is the first process. Oh, really? Yeah, what we do, we extract on one handling. Okay. And then we feed while you still have the snake and you put it away. Then pick up the next snake, extract, feed, return. Gotcha. All right, this little adapter just goes on here to accommodate. Put 
push it up on nice and tight so it doesn't come out. Then we load this into a uh, modified uh, caulking gun. <laughs> I like that. Take a rubber band here, just will aid in keeping our calibration marks where we can see it. And we get the formula will start to flow through here right then we stop. Okay, now we're ready. So it's a three-step process for Jack. First he preps the food formula and feeding tube. Then he milks the venom prior to actually feeding the snakes. And even though this animal's got... See the reluctance yeah, to bite this initially? Is, this is incredible. All right, now, now he's ready. There he oh, goes. Yeah. Now you see, don't... see in front of my thumb the, the uh, indention on the venom gland right there? Yeah, I see that. I was just going to ask, yeah. you, don't have to, you don't have to actually uh, no, force the venom. No. In fact, there's a little bit of venom left on his lip. There's some venom, see, on the top. There you yep. can see you can see a drop of venom just just starting to flow right there mm -hmm. down the bottom. It's it's viscous. It looks clear. As it collects on the bottom, it picks up the yellow color. And we'll just put that down there a little bit of an angle. Now we're going to move over. We're going to feed him. So this uh, tub here has a disinfectant solution. We disinfect the catheter in between each snake. We use a little bit of water here, lubrication. All right, we're going to insert this catheter down. I go in from the side so as not to get uh, hit the trachea there. If you can see, there's his windpipe right there, okay? There's his little fangs, fixed fangs up at the top. All right, this particular size will go right about to here with feeding tube all right and now we will give him about 12 milliliters of food a little too fast okay pull this out all right he's done now uh, return him to his uh, home Jack's passion and experience with these animals really shows. But it's his academic knowledge and curiosity for snakes that truly earned my respect. So, you know, the thing I like about you, Jack, is you're really into the science and the biochemistry of the venoms. What is it about that that really piques your interest? When I was young, like uh, about 12 years old, I, got, I was bitten by a pygmy rattlesnake. And what, after I got through the initial phase of uh, the pain, and it just, Interest me to no end what that venom did to me, coming out of such a little snake, a little little liquid, and I, I really got interested in the venom part of it. And then I got into the toxicology part, and, uh, and then decided I wanted to be like Bill Austin, started actually uh, extracting venom in my backyard when I was uh, 16. What? And, Wait. and selling venom, liquid venom, to Mr. Haas at probably uh, 10, 10 cents an ounce. <laughs> get out of here, that's incredible. You see, most people, when they get bit by a snake, they're turned off by snakes for the rest of their life, but that actually was the, the gateway. It opened to up a, life. a whole other interest in snakes uh, that, that, you know, before then it was just snakes the animal, the keeping, the catching, the hunting, the herping. And then I just, something clicked and I got very interested in the, in, in the toxin part of it. Wow. Um, and back then, we didn't know anything. In fact, every three months, something new is coming out. A new really paper, cool. a new, 10 new doors open. And the crazy thing about snake venom is each snake's venom is different. It's it has different, different applications. Oh, and and it's, right? it's loaded with all types of different uh, pr proteins and enzymes and activity factors that uh, are just now being studied. Yeah. yeah and see, the, the problem with that, in the early days, people looked at whole snake venom to treat uh, issues, diseases, symptoms. Well, now the scientists and the doctors in the medical field and toxicologists are getting together. They're using components of the venom, gotcha. a fraction of the venom, one particular enzyme. Several of the drugs made today come from a, a venom. Wow. Yeah, he's... All right, let's get under the light here. Try and get you guys a good yep. shot. Yep. Okay. Nice. See the chewing? See him chew? Oh, right yeah, right through. Wild. See the venom droplets underneath, underneath the dam. Very viscous. It does not flow until it starts to build up. And I see what you mean. You know, something so seemingly innocuous can be yeah. very detrimental to your uh, body's chemistry. But you can see he didn't need to hang on and chew for minutes to deliver. Nope. Um, 
And we've definitely demystified the coral snake here today, for sure. Okay, now we'll feed this gentleman. All right. Yeah. I've got disinfected because yeah. you don't want to cross, the, you know, just as much as protocol. we can. With everybody biting the, you know, their mouth on the same venom flask, you're going to transmit. It, that's another thing that's different. When you're doing this, you're dealing with a colony mentality, mm -hmm. not an individual. I mean, an individual, you don't want to feed one mouse from another to another. You don't want to handle in between. You take a lot of precautions that you just can't do in this, in this business. This guy, we started at 50. He will get 30 milligrams. Because he's so large. Uh, milliliters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, milliliters. And there's never been any kind of uh, adverse reaction to eating in this way, huh? The animals grow and share. Uh, initially, I killed several snakes experimenting with the, uh, the difference of the contents and volume. I was given too much AD, uh, too much calcium, too much vionate. Uh, and the first thing you'll see is the difference in the feces, and then you know to adjust. Uh, and yes, I lost several snakes. Now this snake, is, to he's going to shed. We got him right when he was ready to shed. So what we'll end up doing with him is probably come back uh, later this evening and put him in a tub of some wet moss to aid him. Uh, he'll probably get most of this off himself. They love to hide. There you have it. I get to help out with some uh, venom research. Got some hands on milking them. I, I think I like letting Jack grab him behind the head. No need for me to be a cowboy, although I like cowboy hats. But uh, no, I appreciate you know the time you spent here with me. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Oh, pleasure's all pleasure, man. Uh, Very cool.